Our guest is the renowned historian whose research has been critical in our understanding of the colonization of Australia and the violence associated with the indigenous Aboriginal Australians. His work can be studied through his many critically acclaimed books and articles. It's my pleasure to have Professor Henry Reynolds on the program. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be talking to someone so far away. So what to you is the importance of studying history today? Well, it's clearly, if you want to understand who we are and where we are now, it's very, very hard to do that unless you have some historical perspective. And in a way, if I can just be very pertinent to the moment, I think what happened in Afghanistan was surely due in part to not knowing enough about the history of the place, uh, a long, deep, deeply rooted history. And I think that's true with almost any society. It's very hard to understand them unless you do know where that society has come from. And equally, in the United States, whereas I told you I have spent quite a bit of time in recent years, it would be very, very hard to get any understanding of the United States without an appreciation of the significance of slavery and the ongoing effect of slavery. And um, I'm very impressed, actually, by American political journalism, by their very, very strong sense of their own history. So, yes, history seems to me to be essential if you want to understand where you are and who you are. What would you say is the danger of not knowing the history or being ignorant of it? Well, there's that famous quote, which many people use and I'm sure or misuse. If you don't know the past, you'll repeat it. Now, I'm not sure that's actually true, but it does, it does sort of point to the problem of an ignorance. You can know a lot about your own lifespan and, and what has happened in that time but if you didn't understand where your society had come from and where its its beliefs came from then it would be very very difficult to understand the present but even look forward to the future now i have often said well historians don't stand on the bridge of the ship and look ahead they they stand on on the very you know they stand on the stern and look backwards but nonetheless, they have some real sense of where the, the, the ship of state might be heading. So you think that a part of the role of the historian is to almost serve as a projectionist for what could happen in the future based off of the previous trends? Well, I certainly think that should be one of the jobs they do. Um, I'm not impressed by political scientists or sociologists or economists in their predictions. They often seem to me to be, uh, think that history will move in straight lines. But of course it doesn't. It, it, it constantly dishes up the unexpected. And uh, we are seeing that now, how suddenly it can change. And historians, I think, have an awareness of the unpredictability uh, of the uh, way in which history can uh, suddenly spring surprises on a society and on individuals. So I do think that any serious discussion about future development should include historians. I mean, they shouldn't be the only people, but their input, I think, should be taken seriously. Bridging into your research, how did you start to study the Indigenous people of Australia? Well, it was really quite by chance, because when I when I was uh, doing history in, uh, in Australia, in the University of Tasmania, um, there wasn't much Australian history taught. This, might, this, this, this would be a surprise to Americans uh, that we didn't really begin to teach Australian history until really the 1960s. Now, as I say, that would be extraordinary. I mean, I, I actually think that the first course in Australian history was taught at Stanford, of all places. 
because Stanford had an interest in Australia and started collecting books very, very early. So I didn't do that much Australian history uh, as an undergraduate. I then did a master's and did colonial politics. And I ended up quite by chance in a part of Australia that I knew very little about, that is far north Queensland. And it's a long, long, I mean, 2,000 kilometres away from where I had grown up in the tropic, tropical Australia. And in the part of Australia where there were still very significant numbers of First Nations people. And I arrived to teach Australian history. It hadn't been taught before, uh, obviously, in this fairly new institution. And I realised, I, I mean, I realised from just living in that society that the question of the relationship between the Europeans, the British, the British Australians and Aborigines and in that place, Torres Strait Islanders, two quite distinctive groups, was profoundly important. I mean, you were aware every day you went out that this was a big issue. You saw a lot of violence. Uh, you were aware of a great deal of racial tension. And so to teach my students, I felt I really have to understand this myself. Now, remember, I knew nothing about, almost nothing about this part of Australia or that aspect of Australian history. So the extraordinary thing was that I had a textbook to use. It had been set by the University of Queensland, which had oversight of our little college. And it was a very good book. It was the major textbook for universities and senior high schools at this time. It was reprinted many, many times. But for me, living in North Queensland, the extraordinary thing was there was nothing, and I repeat, nothing about the Aborigines. They were mentioned twice in passing, and there was, wasn't even an index, an entry in the index. Now, that seemed extraordinary to me because I knew that where I lived, this was a very important thing. So partly to, to understand the situation that I was in myself and to teach my students who had grown up in this society, I had to learn a lot about the relations between the settlers and the First Nations. And so uh, I went to the library. There was almost, there were almost no books. Had there been the sort of library of books that you have in the United States about your prairie wars or about, you know, the, the, the Trail of Tears or all of these great events in American history, uh, then I probably would have read those and used that in my teaching, but I had to go back to the original sources. And uh, the, the, the main thing that was available to me, and remember, we were a long way away. We were a thousand kilometers, kilometers north of Brisbane. We almost had no library resources. But what there was in a small town nearby was the hard copy of the first newspaper in North Queensland which went back to 1861. So I went down and started reading the newspaper, the original. It was not just the news of what was going on, but in a way, the conscience of that small settler society in a place called Bowen. And what fell out of the, the newspaper almost unbidden was the violence. You know, it was, it was inescapable. And it wasn't that people doubted it was taking place. The debate was whether this was an inevitable consequence of colonisation, that you either accepted the violence or you should leave, get back on the boats and go back to Britain. So it was, it was news of violence on the outskirts of the town and then out in the great hinterland, but also uh, this is small societies a debate about the morality of colonisation itself and the 
whether or not it could happen without violence. Uh, so that was where I began. Why did it take so long for history to be taught there? <laughs> well, this is an extraordinary question. Um, the, um, and I got no encouragement. You see, I got no encouragement from uh, the historical profession. Uh, about that time, I went to my first big history conference with all the old you know, senior professors, and I was very young. And I came from this small college that almost no one had heard of. So who was I? And um, I'd been writing a bit of my colonial political material, and I had you know articles published. And the main person in the profession, you know, the gatekeeper for the most important journal said to me, well, now, young Reynolds, now you're up there. What are you going to be writing about? And I said, oh, I might write about the Aborigines. And he said, good God, he said, there's nothing much in that is there. Now, <laughs> now that was the attitude of the historical profession at the time. And it was truly astonishing. Uh, because, you see, I, by then, even by then, I, re well, I re realised two things. One, it was a daily matter of concern where I lived. And two, it had been a, a deeply important question historically. So how was it that a couple of, I mean, perhaps even three generations of Australian history had been written with the Aborigines almost entirely left out? And that's one of the problems that I then had to wrestle with. Did you ever figure out the root of that, the reason for the lack of interest? Well, you can only really only speculate because no one discussed it themselves. They, they never said to themselves, well, in a way they did. Uh, I mean, a, a, you know, a senior professor, you know, in 1959 did a survey of the 30 previous years of Australian historical writing. And he basically said, look, we don't notice the Aborigines because they weren't a warlike people. Uh, they weren't like the American Indian or the Bantu or the Maori who made their presence uh, an important part of the history. We only notice the Aborigines in a melancholy anthropological footnote. So, <laughs> so that was pretty extraordinary. And that was the atmosphere in which I began writing. And there was at the time when I was discovering these things, a, a project that had been set up by the, uh, by the Social Science Research Council. And the man who went round the hist all the history departments telling them about this project on the Aborigines said, and he told me, he said, you know, what I found was not only was no one interested, but I got the distinct impression they thought this was all rather disreputable. So it was a, an extraordinary, extraordinary. And one of our great anthropologists gave a, a national lecture in 1968, which became very famous, uh, in which he called, he talked about the great Australian silence, that the historians had deliberately left this out of the national story. Now, it's partly because they had other themes that interested them. I mean, what they became to concentrate on was the, the great story of pioneering, you know, of the pioneers going out and struggling, not against the owners of the land, but with the land itself, with distance and drought and fire and all of these things, which, which were true. I mean, there's no doubt that there was this, um, it, 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 as you probably know, it was a, a climate that wasn't particularly suitable for British Western European agriculture. It was the driest continent on the world. Uh, pioneering was indeed a struggle with the land. But in doing, in doing so, they clearly elided the struggle for the land. Now, this partly goes back to the way the British decided to colonise, conquer or settle Australia, you know, choose your term. Unlike North America, where 
it was usually common to accept that the Indians uh, before the British arrived or the Spanish or the French arrived, you know, were an occupation of their land. They owned their land and they had a form of sovereignty. And I'm sure your many of your listeners will know that the early American Supreme Court determined they were domestic dependent nations, that they did have a form of internal sovereignty. You had to sign treaties with them and you had to purchase the land. Now, all of that process was obviously often avoided, got around, and the treaty making still ended up with the Indians losing their land. And as we know, a great many of them pushed into the interior. Um, but there was nothing of the sort in Australia. That is, the British arrived with two assumptions. One, that the, the Aborigines uh, were, were, were uh, just, uh, they were wanderers who had not put down their roots. They, they didn't actually occupy any specific areas of land. So the legal tradition that we grew up with as a nation was that the British government, the Crown, as they and we still call it, the Crown became the landowner of all the land. Astonishing. But also the Crown became the first sovereign. They didn't have a derived sovereignty. They didn't get sovereignty by making treaties or war. They didn't take or negotiate the, uh, the sovereignty. Britain simply became the original sovereign because the Aborigines were too primitive to have sovereignty. So it was a totally different um, premise on which Australia was settled. And remember, it's only a few years after the American Declaration of Independence, and it's related to that. But it was, in a way, they turned their back on all the traditions that had existed in North America. So, you see, so the conflict that took place could be seen, it, it couldn't be war because it wasn't about property, it wasn't about land, it wasn't about territory, because that had already been settled. So it was just skirmishing and, uh, you know, revenge and uh, rather a disreputable. And because it was scattered, it was always small scale, uh, it could be overlooked, as I saw. Um, but so it's, it's a combination of the way the settlement took place, the legal foundations which the British put down, that Australia had been settled peacefully, they said, uh, as a tract of land practically unoccupied uh, by uh, practically unoccupied by unsettled uh, native tribes. Why did the British assume that the Aborigines did not occupy the land? Well, it's a very good question. And because they really didn't put much down, uh, it it goes back to the fact that they dis, that <laughs> you, you could say it was the fault of the American the, the American rebels, and so in 1783, when the British could no longer send their convicts to the American colonies, which they'd been doing, as you probably know, for many 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 years, they had to find somewhere else because they had this extraordinary penal code which criminalised theft in particular. And they had large numbers of people who were convicted and sentenced to transportation. And there was nowhere to send them. So in a very, very short space of time, basically within five years of the loss of the American colonies, as they called it, uh, they decided that they would send them to Eastern Australia. Now, this was because uh, the first exploration of Eastern Australia had been by the British in 1770. And so they uh, realized this was a possible place to send the convicts. But it was all done in a very great rush, done by people who had never been there. Uh, the, all they had were the descriptions of the early explorers, and in particular, a very important man. 
uh, and that was Sir Joseph Banks. Now, he was a, a man of great importance. He was a great aristocrat. He was wealthy, well-connected. He was also a botanist, and he was president of the Royal Society, the British Royal Society, but he had been on the expedition in 1770. So he was the one expert the British had. Now, Banks told a parliamentary committee looking into this question that it was reasonable to assume that the interior of Australia was uninhabited. Now, why did he say that? Well, his reasoning went like this. Remember, he was a botanist. He collected vast numbers of specimens to take back to Britain. He said there is nothing in Australia that is edible. There are no, there's no plants that you can eat. And there was not a single sign, not, not a sign of even a, a small area of cultivation on the coast. So we have to assume that there was no cultivation in the interior. And therefore, it is most likely that the, the, the small number of people in Australia lived on the coast from the sea. And that once you got into the interior, there was almost nothing they could eat. So therefore, we can assume that it was probably uninhabited. Now, that was absolutely, absolutely wrong. But that was the assumption with which they came. And as I say, they overturned all the traditions I'd had in both in British North America, that is the United States and Canada, about how to deal with the Indians. Now, was that an attempt by the British government to justify colonization or was that a genuine idea of what Australia was? Well, I think it was a genuine idea, but they didn't know much. I mean, the point was that within, within a matter of months, really, if not years, they realised that all of these assumptions were wrong, that the, uh, the uh, First Nations, uh, they lived in very specific areas. They walked, they moved about inside their area, but they very early came to realise that these were people who lived in very small but quite distinct small nation states. And indeed, they, they had laws and customs. In fact, they increasingly came to think their laws and customs were too strict because, uh, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't encourage people to assimilate because they were too tied into their traditional laws and customs. And they soon realised that every time they went into the interior, they met new, 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 new nations, new people who spoke different languages. So within a very short time, uh, the legal ideas were clearly based on falsehood but it took it took until 1992 with a famous court case in our in our high court like your supreme court the constitutional court um, to decide that no this assumption made in well, 1786 in britain was wrong and that the aboriginal people of australia were the owners and the occupiers of their own land and that where it had not been taken from them, uh, their title still existed. But that was over 200 years later. And we still haven't solved the question of sovereignty. What was the primary motivation of the British colonization of Australia? Oh, well, I think it was, I mean, the, the most pressing thing was to find a place for the convicts. So the first, the first fleet of 11 ships came with 1,100 convicts and a few free settlers and then all the army, the military you needed to, to you know, because of, because of it being an open air prison. Uh, so that, and when they then had their next uh, expansion, when they decided to settle Tasmania in 1803, once again, it was with convicts. Um, but convicts, uh, I mean, convicts served the double purpose. One, they, it was the way to punish the convicts and to expel them from the kingdom, you know, send them to the other side of the world from which very, very few of them could ever return. But they also were a work, it was a workforce. Now, if, if you're colonizing and you don't have slaves uh, and you want cheap labor, then convicts were the solution. And for the first, uh, well, in, in Tasmania where I am, 
I mean, the house I'm living in was built by ex-convicts. Um, for the first 50 years, all the labour was provided by cheap, by convicts who came cheap, who came free to all the settlers. And there's also, it is likely that the British, because they, you know, they had lost North America, as we know, they had lost the American colonies. And so this was the beginning of their new empire. And there's probably also they felt that a port on the east coast of Australia would be convenient for trade with China, which it turned out to be very quickly because some of the ships on the first fleet went north to China to take on Chinese commodities, and some of them went whaling in the Southern Ocean. So they had more than just one idea in mind. They also had empire building and developing a port uh, with convict labor, uh, which could be, uh, you know, as, as they saw. I mean, Sydney did become, you know, a very important port in the Southern Ocean very quickly. Was this a successful deterrent to crime? <laughs> no, not, in, uh, not at all. I mean, the criminal code was so severe. And, you know, in Tasmania, 70,000 convicts. Um, in New South Wales, probably 100,000. It was a very, very big labour force, but there were real problems with it. And one of the most obvious ones was that it was overwhelmingly male. I mean, the, the, the sexual disparity in the early Australian colonies was just astonishing. And the farther you got away from the cities, the greater was the, was, you know, the, the domination of men uh, as opposed to women. And that also had disastrous consequences in their relations with the Aborigines. I mean, the British, the British really having, you know, lost the American colonies, they really uh, messed up the settlement of Australia, one by not recognising Indigenous rights of any sort, and two, by doing it with uh, basically a male workforce with very, very few women. So it, it began badly, and... The convict system went on for 50 years, right up to 1853 in Tasmania. Um, but uh, the law and the relations with the Aborigines continued to be affected. And so it's obvious that just as the United States continued to be haunted by the spectre of slavery, uh, Australia was haunted by the spectre of of an unresolved question with the native people, with the, with, with the First Nations. And the, there was no way, you see, there was no possibility of treaty making. You couldn't, there was, the, the, the Aborigines had nothing they could bring to the table. They had nothing to treat with. So the only way the inevitable conflict over land could be resolved was by, was by violence. And so what was the effect? There was a great deal of of sexual contact. I mean, and it, the whole spectra from, you know, a casual rape, a violent rape, to a negotiated period of cohabitation, uh, to actual uh, people developing uh, relations uh, which were semi-permanent. But, you know, within 20 or 30 years, there was already a significant population of mixed descent people of, of the first generation of young Australians of mixed descent. When they came to Australia, what was the reaction of the Indigenous people? Well, it's a very interesting question. Um, I mean, the, uh, the, the people, it, it depends where you're talking about. I mean, in some places, particularly uh, close to where I am now, there was 30 years of contact with, with exploring expeditions, both French and English. And the explorers would arrive. Uh, they, in almost all cases, there were 10 expeditions over 30 years. In almost all cases, the relations were, were, were friendly. There was almost no violence. Uh, 
partly because the Europeans often had scientists and, and they were interested. It was a time when Europe was interested in native people, you know, uh, with of noble savages of the original condition of mankind in that Rousseauan sense. And so uh, those people uh, had the experience of this extraordinary arrival of, of aliens. Now, remember, the Aborigines had, uh, in this part of Australia, Eastern Australia, on the West Coast, they had been in contact with the Dutch for a century and more. In the North, they had had contact with Indonesians over a long period of time. But in southern, south, southeastern Australia, uh, these people knew nothing about other parts of the world. They just know there were other other places with 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 people who were different. And so the arrival of these large ships, and for them they were large, full sail coming into their bays and dropping anchor, and these people emerging was really quite astonishing. They didn't know where they'd come from. Uh, they didn't know anything. They didn't understand about their clothes. And they had so many objects they'd never seen before. Uh, in some cases, they had domestic animals. So it was an astonishing, an astonishing event for these people. There, there were three things. One, almost universally, it seems, the assumption was that these people had come from the spirit world. Now, if you have no concept of people, other people living on, on the world, uh, but you do have an idea there's a spirit world where people travelled to in dreams, that people went to the spirit world when they died and returned, then it was a reasonable assumption to make that these people somehow had come back from the spirit world. And the fact that they were white had implications about, about death because white, in a way, was associated with death. So there's no doubt for a lot of people they thought these were people who have come back from the spiritual world and they may be our ancestors who have returned. So that was one problem. Another problem was for from the point of view of the people, the Aboriginal people on the coast, and there's, there's a lot of records about this, they could not understand why they were all men. Now, did they have no women? Did, did these people only have one gender? If so, how did they reproduce themselves? Did they have sex? And there are many stories of the and, you know, the, the, the explorers write about this, that they would come along and they would open our shirts and, and try and see if we had breasts. And then if they, they, they would then, they would, if we let them, they would grapple under our, between our legs to try and work out whatever on, what sort of people we were. And uh, on several, they would pick on the cabin boys, you know, the small, remember, remember in this stage, Europeans were clean shaven. So uh, there was no indication on facial features that these were obviously men. Uh, they would pick on the cabin boys, you know, the 12, 13, 14 year old boys and assume these might be girls. And so they would actually undress them to, in, to, to explore them and look at them and, you know, be amazed. And there's one extraordinary French story about the poor cabin boy. Uh, it was in 1802, so he was Citizen Michel and Citizen Michel got an erection when they had undressed him. And, and, and the, the, the natives were amazed and they talked and laughed. <laughs> but being French, they said, it was our impression that these people didn't, were so amazed at the vigour of such someone so young. And we got the impression that they didn't experience this condition as often as we Frenchmen did. <laughs> The vanity of the French. <laughs> yeah, so they, uh, now the other thing, of course, which became very important was, was how guns work. 
Now, the problem, I mean, the, the early muskets that they carried in the early period were not, weren't more effective than spears, but um, for someone dealing with them, you had no idea how ever on earth that it happened. Because the point about guns is that you can't see the projectile. And so they'd hold up this stick and point it, and there'd be, in the old muskets, there'd be a flash as the, as the powder caught, and then a large, large noise almost immediately after, and then something in a distance sometimes was killed, but often not because they're very inaccurate. But even when someone was hit, and this is true as you go into the interior. Now, obviously a person hit has a, has a wound, but you can't see what's inside. So were these, were they, were these guns magic? You know, did they act like lightning? And so there was no doubt endless, endless debate and discussion as they tried to understand, I mean, tried to understand everything about the white men, uh, everything that they could. They would have had endless discussions and they would have had endless discussions about the secret of guns. So, yes, they, they, they had a, they had a, an amazing experience, unlike many, many human beings. Uh, and they had this endless, I mean, in a way, intellectual excitement about how do we come to understand this? How do we, how do we fit these people into our, our understanding of the world? So yes, it was, it was an extraordinary experience. Now that's on the coast. Now inland, people very quickly heard about that somewhere down there in the distance, something extraordinary had happened and news and information would pass back. And remember, Australia was a very large place. A news and information, scraps of information and, you know, scraps of European uh, uh, material culture, uh, you know, bits of iron, uh, bits of glass, bottles, um, and then quite quickly, uh, European animals got loose. Uh, cats, dogs, uh, cows, horses, uh, rabbits, all got loose and, and went into the interior before the white men. And so they had to come to terms with these very strange animals. And the first, I mean, there are, there are sort of stories that, that I collected coming from North Queensland, where the contact was much closer, this early contact, how they first saw the, you know, people who, who looked at the land, looked at the ground and were great trackers and knew everyone, all their people there in their own people, they knew their footmarks. Uh, so they would recognize a foreign footmark. But when they saw the large tread of cattle or horses, they thought, Whatever on earth is this? What what is this a creature? And so uh, many many people. Although the British see the British claim sovereignty over Eastern Australia, whole half of the continent in 1788 when they arrived. But there were many people who hadn't seen a white person for a hundred years. And the last the last traditional people who came in from the desert didn't come in till 1966. So there were still people in living memory who had their first sight of Europeans. It's interesting. It sounds like the commonality of all of the Aborigines is a general intellectual curiosity. It sounds yeah. like nobody retreated. Nobody tried to go up and fight them necessarily at the start. It seemed like it was just a general, you know, curiosity for who these people are and what they're doing here. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, wouldn't you? I mean, what an extraordinary thing to happen. And remember, these were old societies. You know, in Tasmania, for instance, there, there were seven distinct nations with their own languages. They had been cut off by the flooding of Bass Strait, and they had been on their own for something like 350 generations. And in that time, they did, had not become one people. They'd maintained their separate identities and their separate language 
and linguistic evidence shows there was almost no interchange of vocabulary. Now, this is astonishing. So these were old societies. Now, the Europeans assumed that when we arrived, they could simply move on. This was, you know, the banks, the idea that they will simply move on to another place and they will be just as comfortable there as the land that we take from them. But of course, that isn't what happened because people couldn't just move. One, because they didn't want to, because they wanted to stay on their country. And two, they wouldn't necessarily be welcome in the country of other people. They may well be traditional enemies and they would probably get killed if they tried to intrude onto someone else's country. So it was a patchwork, a mosaic of small independent nations. And so if there was conflict with one, this didn't mean that there wouldn't be conflict with the next one. But gradually, uh, people, I suspect, although there's no direct evidence of this, gradually people would move in as close as they could to the first white people and watch them and observe them. Now, these people were hunters. They knew how to move quietly. They knew how to stalk animals. They could creep up to be very close to the Europeans without being heard or seen. And they would watch. And they would go back with all the stories about, about these people who were coming. And they probably quickly understood that what was happening way down there where the white people were was there was a lot of killing. And so each of the small nations had to think, how are we going to deal with what we, as we are reasonably assume will be the arrival of the white men? And so what ultimately prompted the Australian frontier wars? Well, overwhelmingly, the fact that the uh, well, let, let, let's, let's go back. Um, um, the Frontier Wars started quite early, but the, the if you like, the very large conflict uh, really occurred with the spread of settlement, a rapid settlement, after the Napoleonic Wars, when, when free settlers and convicts tip, poured into uh, the old parts of Australia, New South Wales and Tasmania. Now... The problem with Australia was that it was clearly not going to be an agricultural, you know, a, a country of, of growing crops. Uh, the, its future by certainly the 1820s was seen to be a, as a pastoral country, sheep and cattle. And therefore, you needed to have very large areas. So almost despite what the, you know, it's almost like, you know, the way the British tried to, to contain the American colonists um, within, you know, the old colonial boundaries, but they spilt out into the interior and that happened in Australia in much the same way. But as the British, the men in the British colonial office said, this is extraordinary, the speed with which the Australian settlers occupy the country, or basically they occupy the, 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 the sources of water, the river frontages and the, any standing water. So they moved out very rapidly and within, you know, it, as they said, it wasn't like Kentucky. It was more like, like these Australians were becoming more like the nomads of the of the uh, European and Middle Eastern steppes, they simply spread rapidly across the country with their sheep and cattle, which is true. Small numbers with large numbers of animals spilling out into the vast area of Australia. Now, these people uh, believed they had a right to use the land uh, that it didn't belong to the Aborigines, and therefore uh, they had a right to occupy the land. Uh, now, there were often very small numbers of Europeans. You see, there were only, only about six or a dozen with a party and a few drays full of drays with all their equipment on and flocks of sheep with their dogs. 
and they would move into an area and they would immediately occupy the water, you know, the river frontages, any small uh, freshwater lakes and ponds, as you call them. And so there is immediately, uh, you know, a conflict over land and water. How could there not be? And the interesting thing is that the land that was most attractive to the pastoralists was the land that had been created by Aboriginal firing over many, many generations to create open grasslands. Now, the open grasslands, the savannah over much of Australia, was man-made. It wasn't natural. Um, naturally, it would have had a great deal of undergrowth everywhere, but the Aborigines, uh, every almost every day they travelled, burnt a little bit. And so they kept this vast open savanna, which was perfect for their hunting economy. It was also perfect for people with sheep and cattle, but particularly sheep. So they could just let their sheep onto the grassland uh, and onto the, and the, the Aborigines had kept the access to rivers clear with burning for obvious reasons. And so this was so easy then to occupy as pastoralists, but there was no mechanism there was no mechanism where, as happened in Western Canada, in similar country, where the the government with the native, the, 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 the mounted police went out and arranged treaties. Now, that meant that the Indians were confined and the Canadian settlers with their cattle and in their railway got the land, but there was no killing because it was done by negotiation. But there was no such process in Australia, except when individuals did it as a, as a sort of private bargain. And that did happen. In some places, there was a realisation. The Aborigines realised that it's no good going on trying to fight these people. We'll all be killed. We can't get rid of them. Uh, let's, let's find a way we can live together. And so bit by bit, you got these negotiations, uh, private treaty making, private bargain making. Now, that meant that the young men began to work in the pastoral industry and the young women were then taken on a part-time basis, usually as the sexual partners of, of, of the men who didn't have any women. And so you had some sort of accommodation, uh, which was, was often very unequal and often quite violent. But nonetheless, for the Aboriginal people, it meant they stayed on or near their own country. And they didn't concede that they had lost their country. They simply had to find a way of accommodating these white men. And they no doubt saw it, however on earth do we, do we, do we keep the white boss happy? Send a few young girls in keep the white boss happy so we can stay on our land and the fighting will stop even if we have to put up with very, very difficult conditions. And so those private negotiations were treated um, respectfully. They were obeyed. Oh, at, it, it, or we've scarcely begun to look at, at this micro history, um, but I think it will become very, very important. And, a lot of it may simply not be possible to piece together what actually happened. Uh, but it was, you know, you, you had a great variety. Some uh, landowners uh, came to have a sort of paternalistic interest in their people, our Aborigines. Um, and quite clearly, uh, you soon had mixed descent children. And some of the of the white men accepted their mixed race children, others didn't. So it became a, a quite a complex set of relationships. But this became more significant. You see, once you didn't have convicts anymore, and that's true with the settlement of most of North Australia, you know, a huge area, there were no convicts. So there was no cheap labour. So the cheap labour was provided by the Aboriginal people. Uh, the young people 
from the Aboriginal came to work with the white people. And the whole pastoral industry across the whole north, I mean, the main vehicle for uh, settlement, the main vehicle for claiming an effective occupation of this vast area was the pastoral industry, was, we became totally dependent on Aboriginal labour. And the point was that the Aborigines were so good at it. Now, once they'd learnt to ride horses, and they very quickly became superb horse, horse people. I mean, it's a bit like, you know, many of the Afro-Americans on the American frontier and the gauchos on the pampas, uh, mixed descent people who become extremely good horsemen, horsemen and horsewomen. But also they knew the land in a way that, that no white fella could. They knew exactly where everything was on their country. They knew how to, and remember, much of this early settlement was done without fences. It was open range. And so if you wanted to have people who could uh, you know, both find your horses if they'd strayed or know where the sheep had gone or know where there's water, it was the local people. And so you had this, this exchange of, of intelligence, which was so important for the whole industry. And so when the war started, what was the initial impact? Well, it, as I say, because it was so uh, episodic, it wasn't seen as a war by the Europeans. And because it, it couldn't be about property, because that had been resolved, it couldn't be about sovereignty, it had to be about minor things, you know, theft and uh, fighting over women and, and revenge attacks. It was underneath, it was sub-warfare sub violence. It didn't have the dignity of war. It wasn't as Clausewitz would have said, political, you know. That was the way it was seen from the European side, but from the Aboriginal side, it was a matter of life and death. Um, and, but the, the, the conflict was, was so often uh, contained within the territory of those people. And sometimes it was, you know, the, 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 the fighting got out of control. It would begin, it often began. It didn't necessarily begin with white men shooting black men, uh, although that's obviously happened, particularly if you wanted to, to gain complete access to the water um, and, you know, make sure you push the, the local people up into the, into the poor country, the dry country, the hilly country, the mountainous country. Um, if you, uh, if you uh, then wanted to control the situation, you, you may well start shooting people, but some of the killing often began with Europeans being speared. Now, they were almost certainly speared initially as, if you like, police action. They were enforcing their law the law of their country on white men who had broken the law, either because they, uh, they trampled over sacred places that there were taboos about, or they ill-treated young women, um, and they were then punished in a traditional way by, by being speared, sometimes just in the leg, which was the, one of the normal punishments for crime, but sometimes they were killed because they had behaved in an unconscionable and highly immoral, illegal way. And so you got this tit for tat killing that gradually spiraled out of control. The Aboriginal legal world was that, that there had to be, you know, reciprocity. One killing was, was matched by another. You didn't, you didn't go and kill 20 of them, uh, but that became often the Europeans, from the very earliest time, the Europeans' answer to this tit-for-tat tit killing. We can't go on with this insecurity. We can't go on. Remember, they're often surrounded by much, lar much larger numbers of Aborigines, and they've got with their, their party or even the neighbours who might be 30 kilometres away. They're very isolated. Uh, small number of, of European men 
So they say we can't go on dealing with this incredible insecurity. And one of the problems was you never knew where they were. You see, they didn't have villages. You couldn't say, well, go up to their village and knock their houses down, and burn their crops, and kill their domestic animals. You never knew where they were. And they were masters at keeping out of the way. A European party, you know, riding into up into the hills would be, they'd, they'd know they were coming, you know, hours before they got there and they'd disappear. And so you never knew where they were. It was very hard to actually catch anyone if they didn't want to be caught. Uh, so that uh, there was also that sense you never knew where they were. They might be behind you. You know, you might be speared in the back because you would never know because these people were hunters. They could move quietly and get behind you and spear you before you even knew they were there. So there was a great degree of insecurity. And so the answer to that was, let's go out and find a party and, and really, really punish them and stop the violence once and for all. And so that's why you didn't get what, you know, come to be called massacres, that is, you would you would ride around until you and often it was you, you would find a camp at night see a campfire and you would you would very very quietly and slowly get close to them and then before dawn you would go around and you would shoot into the camp so the massacres were a cumulative response to the tit for tat uh yes attack. yes absolutely and and you know there, there were some uh, cases uh, particularly in Queensland, where large numbers of, of the settlers got killed uh, in that sort of way. Um, but it was mainly the other way around. Aborigines killed Europeans singly or in twos and most threes. But the Europeans, because they could, never, they could never find a way to get them, they waited until they could find a large group and say, let's finish it off once and for all. We, it's not mean. I mean, don't mean kill them all because very quickly the realization was that these people were very useful. It was a response to often a response to the the, the you know the killing of uh, some average uh, some Europeans. Uh, but our, in, in the insecurity of the of the frontier, look, I mean, the whole point is that the Europeans were frightened. They were terrified. Uh, they were terrified. These people, as I say, you never knew where they were. They were often more of them than there was in our party, because remember, it was a very widespread pastoral occupation. There weren't very, very few settlements. Um, there weren't large camps, except in those places where there was early frontier mining, but they were exceptional. And you, as I say, you, you, you were surrounded by these people who you felt sure were hostile to you, uh, would kill you if they could. And they were often bigger and stronger and fitter than the Europeans were. They were formidable, uh, except their formidability uh, declined. Remember, we're talking about a century long, conflict over at least a century. At the start, uh, Europeans were on foot, particularly the convicts, and their guns, if they had them, if they were allowed to have them being convicts, were very inaccurate and took a long time to load and reload. And so the between the two groups, there was a, a, a significant equality. While you were loading your musket, a good hunter could probably throw three or four spears at you from a significant distance enough to certainly wound you seriously or kill you. So that uh, there was that equality, but as the 19th century wore on, as in most parts of the world, the balance tipped in favour of the European imperial powers and equally the American frontiersmen. That is very quickly, uh, they got much better weapons and by the 1860s, I imagine, and this may be partly coming out of the American, American Civil War, uh, you had uh, Colt's revolvers and you had long distance accurate rifles. Uh, 
And above all, what really changed it was the European frontiersmen got up on the horses, as they did in the Western Plains. Now, the, the Indians also had horses, but the Aborigines didn't. And so the balance tipped catastrophically in favour of, of the, the, the Australian bushman on his horse uh, with a gun that could kill you far outside spear range. So the balance in the fighting uh, became more and more tipped towards the, the, towards the, the frontiersmen as the 19th century wore on. And so is the impact of these massacres still felt today in Australia? As I say, because it, we're dealing with a, with a very large place and settlement taking a long, long period of time. And remember that even at the end of the 19th into the 20th century, there were still significant areas that where few Europeans had ever been, where people still lived traditional lives, still exercised their you know, tribal law uh, in large areas of the north. But um, the, uh, there's no doubt the memory of, of what the Europeans thought of exemplary violence. We will teach them a lesson once and for all. We, we will go and kill, you know, as many as we can. I mean, often this only meant... Remember, it's a very dis dispersed population, the Aboriginal population, and you often just had family groups, particularly when they're hunting together and where they're camping at night. There, there are small groups. but uh, So that massacres are often four, five, or six, that is a family group, and they are killed uh, as part of this conflict. Now, there's no doubt that awareness that white men were violent and dangerous and unpredictable uh, became absolutely widespread. And people still said, you know, there were people who t said to me in the 1960s about, oh, our parents and grandparents says, never bat chat a white man. Never, never look at him straight in the eye. You put your eyes down. Never appear to be challenging white men because you'll get bashed and kicked and you might even be killed. Now, there's no doubt that that, that ancestral sense of the danger of the white man was extremely important. But, you know, in some places, it's the, the, the killing is almost 200 years ago. In other places, it's only 30 or 40 or 50. And there are indeed places where there might be still old people who remember as children uh, a killing, you know, a, a killing of significant numbers of their relatives. But, or certainly they would have heard from, from living grandparents. So the memory of the violence has undoubtedly been profoundly important. And the, I mean, the point is that the astonishing thing is that in theory, the Aborigines were originally were British subjects. They had, they had no rights, but they had the rights of everyone. They should have been protected by the law, but the law, of course, didn't protect them. And it was very, very difficult to get any, any and, and you know, this is Jim Crow, sort of talk, you know all about this. It was very difficult, even when people tried to bring someone to try for, trial for killing an Aborigine. And by the late 19th century, there, there in a way was a, a general sense that it was no longer appropriate to actually kill people in a town, even a small town. That was no longer acceptable. Uh, you could do it out in the bush, but not in a so, town. In, in, in and around towns in the late 19th century, uh, Jim Crow time, there were a number of cases where there were bad, you know, often very dreadful violence, often, you know, fighting over women, killing a woman. And the white man is brought to trial, but of course the jury simply won't convict. No white jury in outback Australia would convict a white man for killing an Aborigine. 
and that ran through uh, right into the early 20th century and even beyond. But as I say, your, your experience of, uh, I mean, the killing in late 19th century Australia is very similar to, to lynching. That is, it was undoubtedly against the law, just as lynching was against the law. But it was uh, impossible to stop, you know, if anyone wanted to stop it. It was just accepted that is, that is the way of the world. And I presume there were many trials where there were trials for lynching and it was impossible to get any conviction. And that was true of the killing of Aborigines, which was at least technically illegal. From your uh, perspective, has the job of the historian changed over the course of time? Um, <laughs> well, in some ways, you know, I think uh, historians, and, and I mean, there are, I'm sure there are great historical traditions in, you know, in, in Iran and China and India that I know, know very little about. But if you just take the Western one, ever since the time of Herodotus, it has been to explain uh, different times and different peoples. I mean, that is what we do. Um, we, we basically write about things that aren't us. That is, people who lived in the past, uh, people in other societies and cultures and countries, uh, and we explain to the present about the past, but also uh, not just our own past, but the past of other people. And one of the tasks for Australia is indeed to be able to help it explain the extraordinary nature of European colonization, that it, 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 it must still be seen as, as an astonishing event. And in so many ways, we are now just coming to the end, if you like, of the, the, uh, the imperial European venture. Uh, and there's no doubt that there is now a final, if you like, uh, uh, um, assessment, particularly of the British Empire and slavery, you know, all of these things are being questioned. And that is clearly a case for Australia, which has this quite extraordinary story. Um, so historians um, are absolutely essential to explain, and particularly in Australia, and as I explained to you, there were probably three generations of Australians who grew up with a quite distorted and basically uh, over sunny, uh, benign story about their country. And people like me and many of my contemporaries who came along and said, no, no, it wasn't like that at all. Don't you know the true story of Australia? I mean, people were understandably shocked and they felt that their whole understanding of their own history was being challenged. And by and large, people absorb an idea of their history when they're young and when they're at school. And many of them don't change that. You know, they, they live with that for the rest of their life. And so to come along and, and profoundly change their view of the past is very significant. Now, the most significant thing that happened in Australia was indeed this court case, as I said, the, court, the case of 1992 called the Mabo case after a friend of mine, uh, Eddie Mabo, completely changed the land law of the country and in turn land ownership in the country. Now, that undoubtedly was a byproduct of the history. Now, also, I'm in an enormous amount of anthropology explaining uh, Aboriginal legal codes and their sense of land ownership and their belonging to their country, all of these were important. But there's no doubt <laughs> that what really broke through and shocked the country was when the judges of the High Court, you know, like your Supreme Court judges, black-robed and highly distinguished, came out and talked about 
the violence of the frontier and the need to change the way we saw the past. Now, that was when conservative Australia had to sit up and say, my God, the High Court judges have been subverted. And because that case was overwhelming, it was a 6-1 judgment, uh, it showed that Australia had changed as never before. It was, as I say, it was a revolution. Now, part, and part of, the, part of their jurisprudence went back to your Supreme Court, which was the Marshall Court, that defined the relations between the American settlers and the Indians. What advice would you have for young people who are interested in becoming historians? <laughs> well, it's, it's a very exciting, intellectually challenging thing. I mean, it, there is a problem. Uh, there is a problem because at the moment, history is, is, you know, is not doing well in the universities. The universities themselves are uh, employing fewer and fewer people in, on proper jobs. I mean, so many young historians uh, have short-term contracts. Um, they do their doctorates and then they, they do bits and pieces, a bit of contract work here, a bit of marking there, a bit of teaching there. And some of them take years before they get a full-time permanent job or tenure, as I think you call it. And so um, it, it's a very difficult thing. And I mean, the person I've just finished a book with, just published a book on one of the great warriors called Tonga Longata, uh, I advise, and, you know, he had a great, you know, a great future ahead of him. Uh, his thesis was published. And I, my advice to him was, look, I wouldn't try the universities. Why don't you do a, a, a you know, a te teacher training and go teaching? And so he has become, you know, a history teacher and loves it. So I think it's a very, very exciting and important profession uh, that is fallen on hard times. And if anything, uh, Australian history is not nearly as widely studied as it used to be uh, at the time when it was a nice sunny story, which is, which is rather, rather a, a, a problem for someone like me, who is one of the leading practitioners in what came to be called black arm band history. That is, we lamented the past. We, we wore a black armband, uh, you know, saying how bad the past had been. Thanks for watching to the end of the video. To check out more of our content, click subscribe or one of the two videos appearing right now on your screen.